All right, I think uh, we should start. Thanks so much for joining this webinar. And um, it's uh, the fifth of uh, our webinar series, the new webinar series that we introduced recently in July. And today's topic is uh, about the fundamentals of programming. So trying to give you an idea how uh, humans and computers uh, think and the, the differences and all the fundamentals that you find in programming. My name is Anastasios, I'm the e-research training manager and the lead research data scientist uh, at Intersect. And with me today, I have the two presenters and colleagues, Mariam Khan from the University of Adelaide and Aidan Wilson from uh, Australian Catholic University. So if you can guys introduce yourselves. Mariam. Hi, hello and welcome everybody and thank you Anastasia. So my name is Miriam. Uh, as Anastasia said, I am the e-research analyst for Intersect at the University of Adelaide um, and I have a background in computer science. I've been a, a programmer in a past life before doing some technology consulting and then ending up here. Uh, so yeah, I'll be eager to, eager to share uh, some of the things I've learned over the years. Um, and I'm Aidan Wilson. I'm the um, e-research analyst at Australian Catholic University. Um, I'm not a trained programmer or anything. I'm, I'm, I'm actually self-taught in the last, you know, uh, few years after leaving my research where, uh, you know, my research was in, in linguistics uh, and um, I picked up programming after, after that. And now I teach, you know, uh, introductory programming courses to researchers here at ACU and, uh, and elsewhere. Right, if you move to the next slide, Aidan. And... Uh, yep, so we're, we're, before we get, um, before we start today, we'd like to um, uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. Um, we're all meeting online today, so we're, we're, we have different um, uh, peoples to acknowledge. Uh, for Anastasios, they're the Kamaragai, pe Kamaragai people uh, of the Eora Nation, and for me, they're the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and for Mariam, they are the Ghana people in uh, uh, in, in Adelaide. All right, if, a few things before we start about Intersect and who we are. So Intersect is a non-for-profit membership-based e-research organization. It formed back in 2008 by mainly New South Wales universities, but nowadays we are um, governed by a, a consortium of 13 Australian universities uh, across uh, five st uh, states and territories. So here are all our member universities. Um, most of them are from um, New South Wales, as you can see, but we have presence in um, South Australia, uh, in um, uh, AC, um, we have University of Canberra from uh, Capital Territory, uh, and uh, we have presence in Victoria with Dickin and Latrobe. So well, our goal is to accelerate research and we do this by providing um, different uh, services to our member universities. So we're trying to shorten the time from an idea to a solution and uh, outcomes uh, by providing uh, different services. And one of them is of course training. So some of the um, services we provide also is space and time. So compute storage and um, uh, high performance or cloud uh, computing. We provide data consultancy. Uh, we have all the research analysts uh, as well, which, con like, um, which uh, is the team of the services team and um, they provide um, special services and consultancy in the universities. And they, uh, have a, they are the network of Intersect, but also we provide a lot of training and we do it uh, either as a hands-on training or as webinars as we do today. So here is our course catalog. It's the up-to-date catalog that we offer. So this year we uh, invested some time to create some webinars uh, on the awareness level. Uh, and then we have um, different categories uh, and different levels um, for our courses. So we have four categories, which is uh, research computing. Uh, we have programming, a lot of courses in programming, then data analysis, SPSS, Tableau, and Vivo, Excel and then data management where we teach uh, Red Cup, Qualtrics, all the survey tools, Git and uh, others. Um, so uh, until um, now we have trained more than 18,000 um, researchers since 2013, if I remember correctly, when we started this training service. 
And we have delivered more than 1,400 courses at uh, 15 institutions across five states and territories. Uh, in the past few months, we delivered few, a few other webinars. So we started with the Start Coding Without Hesitation when um, myself actually and Aidan uh, compared uh, four of the most popular programming co um, languages in uh, academia, uh, Python, R, MATLAB, and Julia. Then we continue with uh, an excellent course by another colleague um, who presented um, data analysis in Python and R using uh, COVID-19 data. Then we continue with some uh, comparison between uh, the two main survey tools in academia, RedCup and Qualtrix. And um, last month we did also a comparison between um, cloud and HPC and how you move from um, your normal laptop and desktop PC to all these uh, supercomputers and more powerful uh, compute. And uh, you can find all the recordings uh, on our website uh, under the training and webinars. So all the way, all the recordings are there and this uh, today's webinar recording is going to be there as well. So here is our course catalog on our website. So if you go there, you can, um, you can check on the left that we have different categories and different levels. So you can find all the webinars and what we're doing in the levels uh, awareness. Oh no, sorry, the webinars, and it's gonna filter everything by the webinars we're delivering. Also, if you're interested in any other courses, you can select the categories, all the levels, and um, you can find whatever you're interested in. All right, over to Aidan and Mariam now to give this uh, really interesting talk about um, the fundamentals of programming. Over to you guys. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Anastasios. Uh, and welcome once again to everybody who's here. Thank you for joining this webinar. Um, so the, uh, the purpose of this webinar is to give you some insight into the ways that computers solve problems. There are several reasons you might want to do this, such as better understanding the fundamental aspects of programming languages, which in turn will help you better learn those languages. Um, but another more basic reason is that learning this kind of analytical, logic-driven, process-oriented thinking uh, is an excellent way of breaking down pretty much any problem into smaller pieces and approaching each piece in a methodical way. Uh, and this skill is useful for any kind of analysis and not just, uh, not just programming. Uh, so here's our uh, agenda for today. To start off, we'll do a couple of exercises to see the different ways that humans and computers solve problems. And hopefully you'll get an insight into the way a computer breaks down a problem, uh, which will then uh, in turn help you in thinking like a computer and writing uh, effective programs in the future. Um, after those exercises, we'll look at the building blocks of a computer program, uh, those being variables, conditionals, uh, loops, and functions, and we'll explain each in terms of the thought processes you use to approach the, the earlier exercises. And then after that, with those building blocks under your belt, we'll take a look at, the, at, a, at a basic program in R and Python, and we'll look at how those building blocks fit into the broader picture. And in the end, we'll discuss ways that you can write your programs, not just for computers to execute, but also for humans to understand, uh, which is of course a very important uh, aspect of writing code. So onto our first exercise, which is how the, uh, the human brain solves uh, a problem. So we're gonna put up on screen a bunch of numbers and they'll be there for about four seconds. And uh, what we want you to do is to identify the largest number that appears on the screen. Uh, and while you're doing that, they, please pay special attention to the thought processes that you go through. And then after the exercise is over, we'll discuss some strategies which we think uh, how most people might have solved this problem. So the numbers will appear now. Okay, so you probably identified pretty quickly that the largest number was 134, um, but more importantly, what did you do to go there, to get there? If you're anything like us, you probably went through this process without even thinking about it. You might scan the whole space to uh, quickly assess the problem, make some initial determinations, such as that there were some negative numbers and some positive numbers, that there were single digit numbers, double and triple digit numbers. And given these facts, you probably ignored everything with a minus sign immediately, and also only focus on the three digit numbers. These two steps you might also do interchangeably depending on how your brain works. Um, this effective reducing of the problem leaves you with a very simple calculation, and that is which of the two remaining numbers, the 
only three digit numbers is the largest and it was 134. This is a very human way to solve the problem. Humans are good at processing lots of pieces of information uh, at the same time without you even realizing it and honing in on the few important pieces. Uh, in fact, the limit of the number of pieces of information you can retain in your brain at once or your, in your working memory at once is commonly referred to as seven plus or minus two. So for individuals, it could be as low as five or as many as nine, but the average is around about seven. When presented with more things to think about, we tend to reduce the problem to a size that fits into that neat seven plus or minus two. So as Aidan said, uh, humans are good at doing different things at the same time uh, in, in parallel, as it were. Uh, in con contrast, computers are not so good at this, um, uh, generally speaking. Uh, computers are instead very good at uh, single individual calculations, and they can perform uh, millions and billions of them uh, every second. Uh, I am aware that this is a bit of a general statement. There is a ca caveat to this, um, but we won't sort of uh, go down that route for this webinar. Uh, so keeping this in mind, let's now turn our attention to the way a computer might solve a problem. So we'll do another exercise. Uh, the task this time is the same. You have to find the largest number, but only this time around, we present them in a slightly different way and it'll take a little bit longer. Um, but as before, please pay attention to the thought, process that, the thought processes that go into solving the problem and then um, Aiden will discuss afterwards. All right. So how did you solve the problem this time around? Again, if you're anything like us, uh, you probably did something like this. Patiently wait for a new number to pop up. And when it does, decide if it's larger than the previous number you, you were remembering. If it is larger, then remember it and discard the previous number. If it's not larger, then just disregard it and move on. Repeat this until there are no more numbers shown. At the end of all the numbers, the number you are currently remembering must therefore be the largest and it was 170. So by showing you the numbers one at a time, you are forced to process them one at a time or serial, and that's quite close to how computers think. Processing one piece of information in a single calculation and then moving on to the next calculation, discarding information when it's not relevant. Of course, the benefit of computers is it can do this billions of times per second, whereas humans have to wait for new input um, and think about it. Um, Uh, here's an anim animation to explain that graphically. So we start with a space in our brain where we're going to store the only number we care about, the largest so far, which is labeled there. Um, and when we're presented with our first number, we store it as the largest. And the next number pops up and it's larger, so we'll keep it, discarding the previously remembered number. We repeat this process, discarding numbers or replacing the number that we were thinking about until we run out of numbers. When we do run out, the one that we're holding on to must therefore be the largest, uh, uh, giving us 170. Um, and just to, to illustrate an important point on the discarding of irrelevant information, you probably figured out pretty quickly that 170 was the largest number, but uh, do you remember what the second largest number was? This might be a little bit unfair because we didn't ask you to look for it, but that's also kind of the point. Um, you discarded the information that was not relevant to the task at hand. You probably had a pretty good idea that 122 was one of the other high numbers, and you might remember it exactly. Um, and in fact, it was the third highest number. Uh, and if your memory is really good, you probably remember that there was a number somewhere in the 130s that was the second highest, but you might not remember exactly what it was. In fact, it was 131. 122 was probably memorable for you because for a little while at least, um, it was the largest so far, and so you were keeping it in memory. But by the time 131 had, had been shown, it wasn't higher than the highest so far at that point, as 170 had already been revealed. So your, you know, maybe your brain would have discarded it immediately. Here's another way of representing what's happening when a computer solves a problem. For each number, um, we will perform a calculation. Is it higher than the number we've seen? If it is, let's keep it. And we will repeat that step until we have no more numbers left. After all the numbers have been shown, that number we're keeping 
must be the largest. This, uh, this, is, this is called pseudocode. It's not exactly written in the format that a computer can understand, but it's pretty close. And it can be converted line for line into pretty much any real programming language that the computer can then run as a program. And we'll see some examples of this later in the webinar. Great. So now, now that we've uh, we hopefully have some uh, understanding of the serial step-by-step -step nature of a computer program, and have also developed a pseudocode for solving a problem as a computer would, now let's take a, a look at the fundamental concepts and building blocks that we used in this process and used in the pseudocode. Uh, and we'll attach terms to these concepts now as we get a better understanding of what they are. So the first concept we'll talk about is variables. So from our little exercise earlier, uh, we can see that the first thing we need is that, that space in memory to hold the largest number that we've encountered so far. Uh, in our suruko, which you can see uh, at the top there, uh, we call this space largest. Um, and that's exactly what a variable is. Uh, it's a place in your computer's memory that can store things, it can store some values. Um, that a place in memory also has to have a name or a label, and it's typically called a variable name, uh, so that you can refer to that memory and whatever is stored in it later on in your program. Um, and as, as the name suggests, of course, the value stored in a variable can change or vary uh, as your program runs. So for example, at the start of our earlier exercise, the value stored in the variable largest was first 37, but then it keeps changing every time a larger number pops up. So each variable also has to have a type or, or, or data type. Um, some common data types are listed here. So you can have, for example, integers, which are whole numbers, positive or negative. Uh, you can have decimal numbers, also called floating point numbers or, sim or simply floats. Also, they can be positive or negative. You can have strings or characters, which is basically text data. And you can also have Boolean or logical values, which are variables like binary variables that can be either true or false. Um, and you can also uh, combine these to get, for example, lists of numbers or tables or matrices or, or different combinations like that. Uh, knowing uh, the type for each variable is useful for several reasons, uh, in particular because it helps the program know what it can or should do with that variable. So if we go back to, to the exercise earlier, uh, you may have noticed that as numbers uh, were popping up on the screen, there was also at one point a suit of club symbol. Uh, which, which probably made you think, that's not a number, what am I supposed to do with this? So let's say if your largest so far at that point was 122 and the next number was 78, you compare 78 with 122, 78 is smaller, so you discard it. Minus nine is also smaller, you discard that. But then with the club symbol, you can't do that comparison of which one is greater. Uh, it doesn't make, it just doesn't make sense because it's a completely uh, different data type. So, so integers and, and decimals allow operations like addition and subtraction, multiplication or division, and you can also compare them to see which one is greater or less than. But as another example, these may not always apply to strings or text variables. So if you think about it, it doesn't make sense to, to for example, multiply or to, or to divide two strings. It, it, that's just an operator that doesn't apply to that, that data type. So therefore it's important to keep the data type of your variable in mind and you can also check the type of, your, of, your, of a particular variable in your program as you run it to make sure that it is what you expect it to be. So that's a quick intro to, to variables. The second fundamental concept we'll cover today is conditionals. Uh, conditionals are how computers make decisions. So for example, again, at the, if you look at the pseudocode at the top, the second line starting with if, uh, that's a line that compares the values of the two numbers and does something different based on whether or not the new number was larger. Uh, so this is an example of a conditional or an if statement. It's also sometimes called branching logic. But basically, conditionals change the flow of the program based on whether or not a certain condition is met. So while a, a typical piece of code would run one line at a time uh, in sequence, uh, a conditional asks the question and then based on the response to that question, it will execute a different branch of your code or a different block of your code. And then once it's done, uh, it will go ahead and continue running the rest of your program as normal. 
So what kinds of conditions can we check for in a conditional? Um, pretty much anything that can be said to evaluate to true or false. So for example, you can see if this number is greater than that number, or does this string exactly equal this other string? Uh, or you can even combine uh, different uh, expressions together and join them with an and or an or to make more complex uh, expressions. For example, uh, you want to see if this number is greater than that number, but also less than some other third number. So, um, so the typical uh, structure of a condition, a conditional looks something like this. So you have, if something is true, then do this. And then optionally, you can also add more conditions with, with else if. So you could say else if something else is true, uh, then do that and so on and so forth. Else you do another thing in the end if none of the other earlier conditions uh, were true. This last front, else front, this is kind of like a catch all for all the cases that did not sort of, you know, be true at, in any of the other earlier conditions. So you might remember in our finding largest example, uh, we effectively had only two branches. So if the number is, is larger, you store it. And we didn't write this out, but it was kind of implied that if it's not larger, then you discard it. But you can have as many branches as you need. The important thing to remember though, is that no matter how many branches you have, only one branch will be executed for each conditional block every time the program runs. Uh, so illustrate that, uh, here's another example that has lots of conditions and branches. So this is real Python code for assigning a letter grade based on a numeric score out of 100. So let's say that we have a student with a score of 75. Um, if you run this code with that score, the program will check the condition for the first branch. So is, score, is the score greater than 90? That condition is false. So the program skips that branch. Instead, it goes to the next condition. So it is, oh, and by the way, the, the elif uh, keyword, it, this is short for else if in Python. So else if, uh, it will check if, if score is greater than 80. Again, it's false, so it skips the grade B branch. It will then check the third condition. So score is greater than 70, which is true. So then it'll go inside that code block and print that grade is C. Uh, the important thing to note is that from then onwards, it will ignore the rest of the conditional. So it'll ignore the parts for grade D and F. Uh, notice that technically, if it would have checked if score is greater than seven, uh, is greater than 60, uh, that would have been true because 75 is greater than 60. But since it's already executed uh, an earlier branch in this conditional block, the program will ignore these remaining branches. Uh, and that kind of makes logical sense to us um, as well. Um, but yeah, so that's an important point to remember that every conditional block will only have one branch executed um, at a time. Uh, so conditionals are one way that the flow of a computer program may change. Another way is through what are called loops. Um, the fact is humans don't like repetitive tasks. They are mundane, boring, we end up losing interest, and we end up making mistakes. Computers, in contrast, are very good at them. And the way that you can tell a computer to do a, do a task repetitively is using loops. Thinking again back to our exercise of finding the largest number, you are repetitively checking every new number and comparing it to the largest number encountered so far and deciding whether or not you want to keep it. One way to do that would be to basically copy and paste this conditional block again and again and again. Uh, if you had 10 numbers, you'd have to copy it 10 times. That's possible, but it makes your code cumbersome, difficult to read, and if you want to repeat that exercise with, say, 11 numbers next time, your code wouldn't work correctly. So instead, we use what's called a loop in our pseudocode, which is this second line for each, well, this line here for each number. Um, uh, basically meaning keep repeating the next lines for each new number as long as there are new numbers coming up. In effect, a loop repeats one set of instructions over a set of inputs, in our case, uh, in our, case our numbers. Loops are a very, um, a uh, very powerful functionality of programming languages. For example, if you define the steps needed to process one row of data in your table, you can, uh, you can then define them in a loop in your program to apply those steps to all other rows in your data as well. And you can do that by adding only one or two lines of code. So once again, if we look at a visual representation of this, a standard computer program would run these lines one at a time. But when you have a loop, the computer will first check your, uh, your condition for the loop. Um, e.g. if you are looping over all items in a list, 
It will see if there is another item in the list, and if there is, it will execute the lines, uh, uh, the lines of code inside the loop using that particular item. So it will uh, loop back and forth through this, this block. At the end, it will go back to the top to see if there is another item, and if it is, it will repeat. If there isn't, then it will, uh, it will come out of the loop and go on to executing the rest of the code. By way of terminology, individual instances of the code that runs inside the loop is called an iteration, and the, the items over which the code runs, in our case, the numbers, are often called iterables. So let's drill down and see iterations in detail. We've got a reduced set here of uh, uh, input numbers, um, uh, uh, just to keep our example short. So we've got four items in our input, four iterables, which means that if we loop over those iterables, then our loop will run four times, or four, it, it will have four iterations. In the first iteration, we don't have any value for the highest number so far, because this is the first time we're running it, and our current number is 37. We decide if it is bigger uh, than what we have stored as the largest number so far, which doesn't exist yet, so yes, and 37 is now the largest number. In iteration two, 37 is now the, the value for the largest, uh, the largest variable, and our current iterable is, uh, is negative 58. Is that larger than 37? No, so our largest is unchanged. In iteration three, 37 is still our largest number, and our new number to compare it to is 122, which is larger than a 37, so, uh, so 122 is now the largest. Finally, in our last iteration, uh, 122 is our current largest number, and our new number is 170. Of course, it is larger than 122, so 170 becomes our new largest, and at the end of the loop, all we need to do is recall the current value of the largest number variable, and that is 170. The final concept that we'll describe today is functions. So here at the top, I once again have the same pseudocode that we've been using as an example so far, but with one change, and that is I've given our little program our set of instructions, a, a title uh, called find largest number. That at a very basic level is what a function is. It groups together a set of instructions that do a certain task and gives these instructions a name. Functions are often described as recipes. Um, people have the analogy of a function as a recipe. So imagine you needed to bake a cake, but you didn't have a recipe. You might go through some trial and error, um, trying out different ratios of ingredients and cooking times and temperatures and, and things like that. Um, uh, uh, before you landed on an edible cake, uh, but you might go through many iterations or many, many prior steps of inedible things beforehand. So once, once you do that, once you land on the, the recipe that gives you an edible cake, you might write down those steps so that you can repeat it more easily in future and not have to go through all that trial and error again. Uh, moreover, other people might have done this trial and error for you and, for example, published their recipes. Functions are very much like this. You can define them yourself, or you can use functions that other people have defined. To illustrate this, imagine the function is like a black box, just to switch off the analogies, or in my case, a gray transparent box, and we feed in a bunch of uh, input numbers, so this, the, the same four that we had before. Um, our function, find largest, will return an output, and it returns the value of 170. And we can run this again very quickly without having to modify our code just by passing in a different set of input parameters. And it will similarly return an output. In this second case, note that we have less numbers, but our function still runs perfectly smoothly and returns us the highest number still, which is in this case, 88. Awesome. So those were the four fundamental concepts in programming we wanted to talk about. So once again, variables, conditionals, loops, and functions. Uh, we've introduced uh, what they are in a somewhat abstract uh, way so far with the pseudocode. Uh, let's now put all of them together and see what the actual final code would look like that a computer would be able to run. So here is what that pseudocode would translate to in Python. And I'd like to spend a couple of minutes here and kind of go through this in detail line by line with you. So at the first line, we start with defining the function that actually does the work. So in Python, you define a function with the keyword def, it's been read there, uh, followed by the function name, which in this case is find underscore largest. And then in parentheses, you specify what the input to that function will be, uh, which in this case is the list of numbers that we want to find the largest uh, of. Um, and then we end the line with a colon. 
So after, so all the lines after this colon that are indented are considered to be the instructions that are in this function uh, in Python. So the first thing we do inside the function is to create, again, that variable that's space in memory to hold the largest number. Uh, and it has no value assigned to it at the start. So it's equal to none. Uh, the next line has a loop, so th which will iterate over each number in the list of numbers that was inputted to the function. Uh, then line four is, is how you would write the conditional in Python. So that will compare the current number with the largest number so far. And then in the next line, decide to either replace the value in the variable uh, largest or, or not. Uh, and then finally, the last line of the function outputs the largest, uh, the, the value in, in the variable largest. Uh, and we do that with the keyword return. So you'll notice that at this point, we've only defined this function. We haven't actually told the computer to execute this code or even told it which list of numbers to use. So this is kind of like, again, using Aiden's analogy, this is like writing down the recipe, but not actually making it at the time. So when we want to use this function to find the largest number in a list, we have to first define that list of numbers. Uh, so we've done that here in line eight, and we put that list of numbers in a variable called my underscore list. Um, and then finally, it's in line 10, where we actually tell the computer to run this function. Uh, so this is where our find underscore largest function is called, uh, that's the terminology. Um, and it's given the list of numbers that we have stored uh, in my underscore list as the input. And so you pass that in parentheses. So we're going to show you these four concepts juxtaposed in R and Python. So you can see how fundamentally similar these languages are. Um, and in fact, this goes for most programming languages at, at this level, very, uh, very similar. So that if you learn how to code in one language, that knowledge will transfer to other languages. So uh, here on the, on the uh, left, we have the code in Python, uh, sorry, in R. And on the right, we have the code in Python. Immediately, you can see that they're broadly similar, um, but there are some minor differences in how a particular instruction is written in each language. So first, we'll look at the differences in uh, variable assignment. Um, so for example, R uses the digraph less than and a dash in variable in, uh, to assign variables, um, to assign values to variables. Uh, just a, an apology, um, the, the font used here has a ligature which combines the less than and a dash into a nice looking arrow. Um, so uh, it's actually should be written like, like this with a less than and, and, and dash when you're writing code. Python, on the other hand, uses an equal sign, a single equal sign to, uh, to uh, assign a variable. For compatibility, um, equal sign is also possible in R um, for, you know, which, which R has, has made it compatible with other languages because it is most typical to use the equal sign, but the uh, less than and, and hyphen is not um, compatible with many other languages. Um, all right, moving on, we will go to uh, functions. So the first lines of each of these blocks of code have the function headers, which are, uh, which are different. Um, so the way we define a function in R is to first have our function label. So find underscore largest in this case. And then that is kind of seen to be like the, a, a variable whose value is a function, um, which takes some input parameters, which we're calling numbers. Then after that, you, uh, uh, all of your code that, that, that constitutes your function is inside a pair of curly braces. And this is pretty typical, not just for R, but a lot of languages where you've got some uh, curly braces usually to denote um, uh, where some code block begins and ends. Python, on the other hand, uh, has a keyword def, which means define, and then uh, the find largest uh, uh, function name and the list of input parameters here, we've just got one, which is numbers. And important point about uh, Python syntax is um, we don't have these, the, these delimiters, the curly braces at the beginning and end of the function. What we have is a colon and then everything underneath that line is, that is indented um, is, uh, is taken by the syntax to be part of that function. We do write the indentation in R, and this is a convention that's usually used in most languages is to, is to indent. But uh, in languages like R, 
the indentation is not syntactic. What is syntactic is the, is the open and closed brace. Um, but in Python, the indentation itself is syntactic. So that's something to, be a care something to um, pay attention to cross language. Um, next, we'll look at loops. This is what the loops look like. And uh, you'll notice some similarities with functions. Um, so for example, uh, the, the same braces, an open brace here and a closed brace here, define the, what, what is inside that, uh, inside that loop. Um, and the same thing goes in Python. We've got the, we've got the colon and an indentation so that anything indented at this level or greater is part of this loop. Um, uh, another difference is that they both have this keyword for and another keyword in. And where Python, we don't have these, these parentheses. In R, we do have these parentheses to, to wrap around the, uh, the iterators. Conditionals, again, very similar within each language. Um, uh, and the same, the same corresponding differences kind of occur across languages. So uh, again, we've got the braces to delimit the code block. So this largest, uh, 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 largest has now the value of number is, the, um, is, the, is what gets run as part of the conditional. And those are delimited by these, by these braces. And the same thing happens in Python. So we have this, this colon and then indentation. So this largest equals number is what is run as part of our, as part of our conditional. Similarly, um, in Python, we do not have parentheses here, although you can include them, especially if your expression is more complex and needs a few ands and a few ors, and you need to make sure that the order of operations is such that you get exactly the right, the right true or false value. Um, in R, though, as with lots of languages, these uh, parentheses are, um, are required. So hopefully you can get a sense of how these two languages are really very similar. And in fact, most languages at these basic levels are very much the same as one another, including MATLAB, Julia, Java, C++, etc. It's only when you come to more complex applications of these languages that they begin to diverge. So moving on, while it's true that when we write a program, we write it so that it can be executed by a computer, we must remember that this program will also be read by humans, including collaborators, uh, for example, other researchers, like if you publish your, your code as part of a, a publication, and also your future self. So if you revisit the work you've done um, earlier and, and rerun it later, maybe with a new data set, or you need to tinker with your code to make sure it runs properly given new changes to your analysis, then you'll be reading back your code again and again. So there's a number of good habits or conventions that we should follow to make programs easily readable for humans as well. Uh, variables should be named in a mnemonic way so that you can understand what the program is doing just by reading it. A computer will execute the code, the code fine no matter what. The names of variables and functions is arbitrary as far as the computer is concerned. So as long as it is syntactic, it will execute. However, humans will be reading this too, and they need to be able to read things um, and understand them. So this is important when you yourself might need to revisit your code in future, and you can't quite remember what you meant originally. It's also important if you share your code with others, which you will find yourself doing. Besides being mnemonic, there are conventions around the format of a label, that is a variable or a function name. We cannot use spaces in these labels in programming languages because a space is interpreted in a special way. So each word in a multi-word label will be, you know, if we leave spaces in, will be interpreted on its own, which is bad. Uh, often though, we want to have multiple words in our labels, like, like find largest. Uh, from our earlier example. To get around this problem, there are several conventions, two of which we'll mention as the most common. The first is called camel case, where uh, we remove all the spaces. So we just literally uh, uh, match all the words together. And um, each, each word after the first word is capitalized. So hence the camel. So we get this hump in the middle with a capital letter in the middle. The other convention is called snake case, where we everything is lowercase and spaces are replaced by underscores. Another convention is to, you, to include the units on variables for values that have units. Uh, so if you use snake case, you might uh, include these at the end after an underscore, such as in weight underscore kg for a weight in kilograms or temp underscore c for a temperature in Celsius. Importantly, once you've picked a convention, you should stick to it. 
your convention could be different to these, but whatever it is, you should be consistent, um, even just to yourself. Another thing to note here is that programming languages almost entirely are case sensitive, so you should be aware of that. Let's look at this with an example. What we have here is a function that is written perfectly well from the perspective of a computer. It is completely syntactic. It, ha it has no errors and will generate some output when run on some input. But from the perspective of a human, um, it's not particularly well written. We could work it out, uh, work through it and figure out mathematically what it's doing, but it's not clear to us what the purpose of this function is. So if we rewrite this using our conventions of mnemonic variables and function names and consistency, we can see that it makes more sense. Hopefully you can see now just by looking at it and without having to run it, that this is a simple program to find out the total internal angles of a polygon of some number of sides, i.e. that a square has 360 degrees and a triangle has 180 degrees and so forth. These two programs are functionally and syntactically equivalent and the computer treats them equally, but the latter is absolutely easier for a human to understand and therefore has the edge on the first one. A couple of things to note here. We have a variable called temp, which is kind of like an intermediary step. Um, uh, There's a convention that means temporary. Uh, so we're generating a temporary variable to give us the, the arithmetic step between the number of sides of the polygon and the sort of coefficient to multiply against 180 to, to, re to return the number of, uh, number of, of degrees. Um, this is very common to use the word temp for this, um, but uh, be aware that if you're working with temperature data, temp might also be used as a, a natural abbreviation for, for, for a, a, a temperature value. Secondly, you'll notice that we use both camel case, as in total internal angles, and snake case, as in number of sides. And you might think this is being inconsistent. On the contrary, your convention might be to use camel case for function names and snake case for variable, variable names which is what we've done here. And that's completely fine. And I think uh, most developers have a fun, have, uh, 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 most developers have uh, uh, forming conventions around what kind of formatting is used for what kind of variable, whether it's a function or a variable name. All right, so the other major way that you can write your programs for humans to better understand is to make judicious use of what are called comments. Uh, comments are just pieces of text in your program that are not executed by the computer. They are deliberately ignored. Uh, comments in code are used for multiple reasons. You could be using them for testing or for planning, which we won't go into right now. But, but they can also be used and should be used for documenting. So comments uh, allow you to include human readable text that explains, uh, for example, what a chunk of code might do. That way, if someone perhaps even your future self, is, is rereading a program to modify it for a different purpose. Uh, for example, the comments you have put in will greatly help in understanding what the code is doing, and so you can modify it as you need. Uh, critically, comments are useful for yourself uh, as well as anyone else reading your code. And since you may forget things quickly, it's a very good idea to comment early, comment often, and don't leave this kind of documentation until the end, by which time you might have already forgotten what your program does. And I unfortunately speak from experience that that does happen. You forget very quickly um, what you intended to do. Um, there are several ways for marking comments, uh, depending on the language. Uh, so for example, in both R and Python, anything that comes after a hash symbol uh, uh, on any line is ignored. Uh, so this means they can go on their own lines. You can have a hash at the start of the line, in which case the computer will ignore the whole line. Or they, they can come after something else. And so some code followed by hash and then a comment. Um, there's lots of different conventions, but this is language specific. So you, should, you can find out what is relevant for your language. Um, and reading someone else's code is also a good way to see what the convention is in a language. So where do you typically put comments for certain things? Uh, you, there also are comment locks, so which can span multiple lines, but we, we won't uh, talk about those here. So, so just to illustrate that further, um, here is our internal angles example once again, uh, but this time it's a bit more complicated. So we have added a conditional that checks to make sure that the user has entered at least three as the number of sides and stops if they haven't. Uh, anything less than three, and this kind of function, it makes no sense because you can't have a polygon with less than three sides. 
Um, so this, uh, this extra piece of, uh, of code tells the program to stop and warn the user that the number they've entered is invalid. Um, however, the point to, here is to note the comments, which are gray in this color scheme. Uh, so there is, you can see there's a comment first at the top of this function that explains just in plain English what the function is intended to do. So you can know what the function is supposed to do even without having to read through uh, the rest of the code. Um, after that, there is also a comment here in this conditional block that explains that three is the number, uh, the, the minimum number of sides of a polygon. And at the end, finally, there is a comment at the end of this line that explains what this line does. It's forcing the program to stop processing. Uh, so once again, I'll, I'll reiterate that uh, anything after the hash is what's interpreted at the comment. So all of the code uh, in this last line will still be executed. Um, and then the comment will start after, after the hash. All right, so that brings us towards the end of this webinar. Hopefully that would have given you some idea of the, um, the sort of the paradigm shift between how we as humans think versus how computers think. And it also have introduced some of the key tools and concepts you have at your disposal uh, to write computer programs to solve your problems in your research. Um, so where can you go from here? Uh, the next step we would suggest is to keep an eye out for introductory courses in programming in, in, in your programming language of choice. Um, most universities will have training options for these. Uh, if you are from one of Intersex members, you can access our training courses at your campus or online. So you can just take a look at our website to see uh, what courses are happening at your uni or even at other unis. Uh, or you can find your local ERA, it, your e-research analyst, to ask them whether there's any coming up. Um, so that we're sort of towards the end of 2020 already, but we'll start scheduling for 2021 um, pretty soon. Um, also, I'll just point out, there are several free online platforms for you to start coding in, uh, depending on which language you want to pursue. So there's, for example, Google's Colab for Python, um, or there's RStudio Cloud and MATLAB Online for each of those languages, respectively. Um, and then if you have access to Cloud Store, probably through your institution, uh, you can also use Swan for Python and R and, and Octave. Um, and lastly, uh, the, like as I mentioned earlier, you can also look at other webinars in this Intersect webinar series. Uh, the recordings of previous webinars that we've done are already uh, on our website. Um, in particular, I would recommend this webinar that, that was mentioned at the start uh, called Start Coding Without Hesitation, Programming Languages Showdown. So if you're new to programming and you want to start programming, this is sort of a nice next step because in this webinar, uh, we introduced the four popular programming languages in research. Uh, so Python, R, MATLAB, and Julia. And, and uh, we compared them across various characteristics and metrics. And that may help you perhaps decide which one would best, you, uh, best suit you and, and your research needs. So that's everything from us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will, uh, we're more than happy to answer any questions. If you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A uh, chat. And of course, if you have any questions, you can email us directly at uh, training at intersect.org or visit our, our website. So yeah, happy to answer any questions. I'll hand over to Anastasios for the Q&A. Thanks, Mario and Aidan, for this great talk. Um, even myself, after so many years, I learned a few things as well. Uh, I'll, uh, yes, please uh, add any questions in the Q&A and I'm happy to ask uh, the presenters. So I'll start with um, the first one. Um, hi guys, I'm doing research about economics in the healthcare area. I'm very interested in data science and would like to learn the techniques. Would you like to share something about self-learning in data science, like learning sources for self-learning or do I need a degree or some certificates if I would like to have a job in the future in data science? Thank you. I'm happy to answer this one as I'm coming from a non-data science background as well. So my background is physics. I did a master's also in computational physics and uh, I was learning all these programming languages as part of my journey in uh, academia. So I end up learning like around eight, nine programming languages because each topic in physics has different uh, preference to programming. So the, you don't really need a certificate or proper kind of um, education, but you need uh, for sure to illustrate that you have experience and knowledge in programming or any other tools that are required in data science. So I would say investing time in learning uh, all this uh, programming is for sure one of the best things to start with. And um, as we say in the programming uh, language showdown with Aidan, 
Um, after a bit of research, we found out that uh, knowing more than one programming language makes you um, more in employable and with better, better salaries and more opportunities as well. So investing time on this one, um, yes, I would definitely recommend as a starting point. Guys, do you would like to uh, add anything on this? Uh, yeah, the same, um, same person has, a, has, a, has a, uh, another question, which is which one, R or Python, would, would we recommend? Um, well, I'd recommend you watch the other webinar <laughs> that we go through this, but um, just, to, just as a spoiler, um, it very much depends on what people are using in your discipline um, or in your, in your research team. So if, if, there's a, if there's an existing standard, people are using Python, um, for example, then, uh, then, then you, should, um, you should stick with that. But more, more information on that in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the other webinar. And yeah, I would also say that, you know, as someone who I didn't do computer science, I picked up programming just self-taught um, much later um, after I'd finished up with my research, um, sort of as a hobby, um, which has become quite useful to me now. I, I program a lot. Um, I think it's a really good idea just to get your hands dirty and just jump in and start trying out a few things. There's lots of online resources for self-paced learning. Um, there's a great course by... Um, a guy called Charles Severance um, called Python for Everybody, I think it's called, P4E, um, if you want to learn Python. And R, I'm sure there's, you know, Python is one I cut my teeth on. I'm sure there's similar um, online resources for, for R. And of course, there's Software Carpentry and um, Software Carpentry, you know, we uh, intersect, uh, teach the Software Carpentry courses, um, uh, these are introductory courses in all, all of the main, major languages. Um, these are, and the material is, is openly accessible online. So these are great resources to get started. Just to add on this one as well, that um, like R and Python are great. Uh, they can do anything you can imagine. Uh, however, personally, I would recommend Python for one extra reason, which is the errors and how easy it is to solve things when you're an absolute beginner. So R usually likes warnings and doesn't like to interrupt the code. And sometimes it's really hard to guess what the warning is and why they give you a warning or why they give you an error. So Python is much better and much um, trace back, which is actually the algorithm behind the scenes is much better and much clearer, like what's going on. And um, uh, it's easier to solve problems and everything. And also for self um, based courses, I would definitely recommend to maybe attend some hands-on training in the beginning to get some knowledge from experienced people. And then as you, as you are more knowledgeable about the, the topic of programming, then definitely you can start uh, working on um, specific things. So usually like people, when they're beginners, they tend to attend this hands-on training while as they're becoming more advanced users, they, they can do like whatever they want by just checking videos or self-paced tutorials. So in the beginning, I would say like, it's easier to connect with people who know all this, um, have this knowledge before you start your journey. All right, second question is, um, hi, I wanted more explanation about how computer uses the memory for solving problem. Uh, in other words, how many nodes and memory will require us so, uh, to solve a certain problem is there a way to tell? Marion, that's probably more to you because uh, of your background as well. Yeah, I'm thinking of what the simplest way, so simplest way to answer. So we kept things quite simple in this web. So from your question, the terminology, it seems like from nodes and memory, you may be thinking about like high performance computing or a very large computer with multiple nodes and CPUs. Um, uh, I, guess, I guess there's no simplistic answer. If you have very, if you have very big data files, really it's measured by how much data you want, does your computer need to access at the same time? And that kind of defines how much RAM you need. The, the simplest way I guess would be to do us, if you're using let's say HPC to do a small test on like a smaller data set and then see, all right, if you have 10 times this, you can roughly extrapolate. But I don't know if there's like a very easy, um, sort of easy, there, there isn't always like an easy a way to estimate that in advance other than maybe doing some tests. What do you think? Aiden? I have no clue. <laughs> Not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, same here. I mean, um, um, I don't have that deep knowledge of how computers, computers are working because I think me and Aiden are coming from a completely different background. So we haven't been to that deep, deep knowledge of like operational part of computers. So 
I guess the only thing that I'll add, that people might know this, but I'll just reiterate this, that there is essentially two kinds of memory, um, which is of course the long-term memory, which is kind of like your hard drive, and there's the active memory, let's call it, which is your RAM. And I'm assuming that when you're saying memory, you're referring to, to the RAM. Um, and that's really often what the limiting thing is, because if you have, a, uh, if you have an operation you want to run on, let's a data file that has like, you know, 50 gigabytes of data that you need all of it at the same time for, for a certain step. That's what defines how much memory you kind of need. I am oversimplifying, but yeah, roughly speaking. And, and yeah. I suppose that kind of comes into talking about the things that we deliberately didn't include in this. Like when we earlier said there are some caveats around, you know, computers generally speaking are not so good at this stuff. Um, that is processing stuff in parallel. There is, of course, high performance computing and parallel programming, which are very advanced topics that we, we didn't want to cover today. We do have webinars, um, a webinar on that, particularly the last one, which is going from your desktop to the cloud or HPC. So maybe take a look at that. Yeah, and if we're talking about memory intense calculations, um, I think different languages, um, like I can answer this one at least, or uh, different languages can man manage. Uh, uh, memory in a different way and better way. For example, Python is much better than R, for example, and because like on the way um, memory is handled by the programming language. However, um, as Aidan uh, and Marion probably mentioned as well, like uh, if you are limited by memory or your desktop, like you can always find solutions in academia because you can access all these big machines and do your jobs there and perform any calculations there. So it's not like um, when I started actually, like where you had to delete variables because the memory was so so small that you, need, you needed to be careful all the time. Like for something that you calculate later on, you delete to empty some memory. So now we're um, having like a lot of capacity for that. All so right. Move on, there's a few more questions that have come in. Um, there's a question, how many tasks do you consider a human can afford and do well at the same time? And do females differ from males? Ooh, um, this is a tough one. Uh, the, the stuff around the seven plus or minus two was really just glibly dropped in from some literature that I know of, but I haven't really invested much, much time in. Um, but, uh, you know, this is referred to in pedagogy circles about not dumping too much information on someone at one, one time, but it kind of also applies to, to this if we, if we interrogate the way that our brain kind of goes through a problem. Um, so if you think about like how you learn a phone number, you might have, 10 digits in your uh, mobile phone number, but we chunk them up into the first four, the second three, and the third three, right? The first, the first second, and third chunks, which have four digits and three digits. Um, and uh, that's, that's the way that humans parcel up information into smaller, in, into a chunk. So it's easy to remember a four digit number um, uh, and a three digit number. And, you know, we can therefore remember a four digit number and a three digit number up to you know a reasonable limit of seven plus or minus two. Um, if you Google seven plus or minus two, you will find that the articles that talk about this and they'll go into much more detail. Um, and I have no idea whether it differs by gender. Yeah, I have no clue actually, to be honest. I don't know if you, Mariam, know anything about that. No, I don't know about male or female, but yeah, how you described it is exactly right. That, uh, the, the when you have essentially seven boxes in your brain, how much you put in that box is how much you can. So it's kind of like what you're, what you're able to uh, store or handle together. So for example, if you're driving, when you're new, you, each action that you have to do when you're learning, it's kind of a different thing. You have to be conscious about each one. Once you become comfortable with driving. Into one box, as in yeah. driving box. Exactly. So, you, so then that becomes one box. So, so it's very hard to say. So that we, that seven plus minus two is kind of like, I don't want to call it pop science, but it's not that specific. What you, how much you could fit in that box would really vary person to person or toss to toss actually. Um, there's a question in the chat um, around for beginners, would you recommend online services and coding uh, or desktop? Um, I, I would probably recommend online services like uh, cloud store Swan it's really good. Um, because you know there can be bit, some issues with installing, particularly Python doesn't install very well on a lot of computers, I have to say. Um, uh, and if you install and upgrade over, over the months and years, you can get sort of this weird different versions going on and it can be a little bit complicated. R is much easier. You can install R and R Studio and you're good to go. Um, but uh, in any case, um, 
there is the rstudio.online, which uh, is free up to a certain amount of, you know, it doesn't run very fast or anything, but for doing what most people need to do, it's very, very good. Um, and similarly in Swan, you can get access to um, R, Python, and Octave, which is an open source variant of MATLAB um, in the browser. And that's great because that stays there. You can change computers and open up your same, your same session, which is uh, really fantastic. Any other input on that? And uh, um, just to let everybody know that um, the only thing you need to uh, you need in order to connect to Swan or Cloud Surf Swan is just a university email because all Australian universities are part of this. And um, yeah, you can connect and you have also part and uh, some space as well from Cloud Store. So it's a really good uh, way to start doing things. Uh, we have another question as well. Like, uh, thank you for the great and informative webinar. Can you please share your own experience of self-learning programming, dedicated daily hours, study routine, study plan, and what practical projects you worked on during self-study? I'll start. I guess that goes you. to me because I'm the self-taught one. I guess Anastasia, you also are. Largely, you can you can start. Then. No, no, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, all right. Well. Um, uh, I, my, I, I was very much not formal about it. Um, I got a, I got an ebook by uh, the, the Python for Everybody ebook, which has a, a bunch of hour long lectures, and I watched them on the train. Um, and then later, I would maybe go and do a few. There were exercises in there, but I would, I would go and do the exercises later. What really helped me learn a lot was, um, uh, was teaching Python uh, and first assisting other people teaching Python. Um, and then taking over myself and teaching Python. So te teaching other, you know, transferring knowledge to other people is often the best way of internalizing that knowledge yourself. Um, and, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be um, embarrassed to do things like, you know, get a question and say, I don't know, I'll have to Google it, right? Because no one can be expected to remember everything. And when people are programming, they're not going to remember everything. You're going to look up like, oh, what, what's the syntax of a, of a loop again? You know, what are, what are the parentheses I can use? How come this isn't working? And you find a lot of help online. Um, but I don't really have a good idea on a study routine or a study plan or anything like that. As for practical projects, what I like to do is, um, and what I've done is convert, uh, is create little Python games, just text-based games, like, um, uh, let, you know, uh, a countdown where you have to pick vowels and consonants and make a word out of it. Um, I wrote a little program that randomly pops up some letters and you, you ask for a consonant or a vowel and then you're given a you know given 30 seconds to come up with the longest word that you possibly can um i just wrote a little little script of you know uh, to do that in in python and just working on those sort of things makes me sort of go oh, how do i do this little bit um and learn a little bit more each time okay for me it was a bit of a different journey because i had to do it as part of my studies but there is a tricky part there where I found like a lot of people stuck and there are two paths. One path is that you can learn programming as much as it's needed for doing things in your projects and everything. So that's what I was doing initially. So I was, for example, like having a lot of um, problems like complex systems in astronomy and trying to solve them. So you learn the basic things, you try to solve them, you can solve them and, but you're missing one other thing. So you're missing the deep knowledge so I would definitely say like when I switch to like reading a book, understanding more about programming and then start going again, opens up a lot of more uh, ideas. And um, as we say, like creativity in terms of programming, like so you instead of just trying to solve problems like by like the way you, you learned um, in different um, based on your different background, then it opens up a different way of thinking as well. So it's, it's, it's worth the investment of like the deep knowledge in the beginning and then trying to understand. And as for projects, I was going deeper and deeper into just practicing based on whatever I could find that already exists. For example, like uh, in physics, is one of the common big problems is the three body problem. So you're taking some code and you're trying to solve this one based on whatever you can see and trying to improve things or trying to experiment things. Uh, so if you are willing to have this programming as a skill for uh, later in your career, you need to invest time. It's not uh, enough to just practice based on your domain and just use it um, up to a level where it works. So there, it's going to be required all this knowledge later on. And it's going to open up also, like as we, um, we mentioned, that 
later on, like if you have this deep understanding of the fundamentals, uh, it's super easy to learn uh, a new programming language. Like with Aidan, one day we discussed about Julia and we were saying like to each other, like, okay, let's learn Julia. And we created a course in Julia and we're using Julia, we're testing Julia. So you can do all these things like super fast. So, and I turned turn my hand to JavaScript, uh, largely for Google Apps scripting, automating things that come out of Google, like spreadsheets into calendars and so forth. And it was an extremely easy switch to make from knowing the fundamentals to transferring skills from one language, Python, which was my comfortable language, to JavaScript, which, you know, basically just make these, make these changes in your brain and, and then it works. And in the beginning, you may find it hard because like usually like we're living in an era where we want things to go faster and we don't go deeper into the knowledge because we want like to try, uh, take different uh, information from everywhere because it's required for the workforce. But I would definitely recommend, even though like it, in the beginning is going to be a steep um, process, like line, the line, the learning curve is going to be really steep. Like when you start understanding all this, like and have a deeper knowledge, the curve is going to be super like fast. So in the beginning, it may sound that it takes a lot of time, but it's worth uh, investing time. And someone's just helpfully put in the, the reference to the 1956 paper by Miller uh, on um, the plus or minus, uh, seven plus or minus two, um, uh, which is a paper in Psychological Review from 1956. So thank you for that anonymous attendee. Yeah, well, yeah. that brings us, um, uh, I think that brings us to the end of the questions, unless I'm mistaken. No, I think um, all the questions are answered. Uh, so at that point, I think we will thank everybody for, for, um, for coming and, uh, uh, and we will see you at the next webinar or the next training course. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks, Aidan and Marim.